You're listening to a podcast from 702. The Naked Scientist. Dr. Chris is digitally in the building or remotely in the building and he's available to take all of your science-related questions. Give us a call 011-883-0702, the WhatsApp line 072-702-1702. Doctor, how are you doing? I'm in the house and I'm feeling good. How about you? Same as you, except my house is a studio in Santon. <laughs> but we, uh, I'm looking forward to take some of these questions that have coming th- uh, come through. We've got Moses, our first caller from Pretoria. Moses, go ahead. What's your question? Hello, Nebu. How Hello. are you? Good, I'm thanks, and you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, my question to the, Dr. Chris is about... Uh, palpitation, what causes palpitations and what would be the remedy or the cure for palpitation? Mm. Hi Moses. Um, The word palpitation is used to describe the sensation of an altered heartbeat, whether it's your heart thudding very fast, whether it's beating harder than normal, if it's beating irregularly. So it's the sensation that something's different about your heart rhythm. But it's the symptom rather than what doctors would refer to as a sign. In other words, something physically has changed. And there can be a range of different causes, whether it's being stressed, because when we have the fight or flight reaction because we're worried about something, this leads to the production of adrenaline and adrenaline-like chemicals in the bloodstream. And this makes your heart beat harder and faster. Under certain circumstances, some drugs that people take, both legitimate ones and illegitimate ones, can make your heart race. Caffeine is the most common of those. If people drink too much coffee, it can put your heart rate and blood pressure up, and that can produce palpitations. Also, some people have an irregular heartbeat. There's a condition called atrial fibrillation, where the heart develops an abnormal rhythm, and the beats are irregular. And if you take your pulse, you'll find that they're irregularly irregular. In other words, there's no regularity to the irregularity. And this can also produce a sensation of the heart beating at the wrong rate, because instead of a steady tick-tock rhythm, you get beats coming here and there. People also get what's called a, a missed beat or an ectopic. And they sometimes notice this when they're stressed. It can also be provoked by other lifestyle factors like those I've just mentioned. And when you get those symptoms, you, you'll have a normal heartbeat, but then you'll suddenly be aware that your heart gave an extra beat. This is very common, and most of the time it's completely harmless. But if you do develop a new or altered heart rhythm that comes out of the blue, or it's associated with chest pain or breathlessness, and you have underlying risk factors for having a heart problem, if this comes along all of a sudden, you have other symptoms that go with it, and it doesn't just disappear, then you need to go and get that checked out just in case. Okay, thank you so much for that question. Now, Doctor, um, I've got an interesting one here. I saw a video this morning by a guy on Twitter by the name of Roberta Nixon. And, you, you know, we started seeing pictures last week of the Pope in this, like, white bomber puffer jacket. I don't know if you saw that those pictures that were going around. And people were saying, can you believe this is an AI um, sort of created image? It's not a real photograph. So what fascinated me today, that didn't fascinate me that much because that's almost what Photoshop was doing for the past, you know, couple of years. Now, this particular guy showed and demonstrated how he loaded clips of Kanye West speaking and then he wrote a rap as Kanye West and then loaded the voice and the song that he created, you cannot tell it's not Kanye West doing it. So my question is, where AI has now reached this level that your average person has access to it, where we won't be able to tell whether, you know, that is the person rapping, that's the thing they said, that's them in the photo or in the video. How far, how much further can it go? Like, can we start manipulating how we look in real life like i'm trying to imagine where this ai can go because it's scary from a privacy legal point of view and all of the other implications of somebody can come with a recording saying you confess to this murder 
but how do you tell it's not the person? This is the era of deep fakery, and that's the phenomenon you're describing. And it's incredibly powerful. And it was brought home to me how powerful when someone directed me to a website last year and said, look at these pictures. And I looked at the pictures and they all showed lots of healthy, happy looking human beings. And I said, yep, there's some pictures of men and women and children here. Um, what's the story? And they said, none of those people exist. Wow. And I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, those faces were entirely computer generated. And so they're, I, not even, fairness, they're not even lookalikes of people that exist. They're just brand new faces. Correct. And that was my first introduction to how good and how powerful this technology is. This wasn't some cartoon avatar. This was, to my mind, a perfectly normal looking person going about their business, smiling for the camera as they were having fun doing something. Now, if you can create a human de novo like that and make it look convincing, it's not altogether difficult to then take an individual whose likeness already appears out there and then superimpose on it other things such as singing and that kind of thing. And we, we actually did a program on The Naked Scientists a year or so ago about music. And we featured as one of the stories a computer algorithm that can take the works of well-known performers and then make them perform new works that sound just like they do. So you don't just have to do this with visuals. You can do it with sound. And I was listening to a bit of Frank Sinatra or what I thought was Frank Sinatra until we played it to another uh, expert. That was Rick Wakeman, the audio keyboardist of uh, Yes fame. And he said, that's not Frank Sinatra. And when I then checked, indeed, it wasn't Frank Sinatra. It was a fake. And I mean, we, we didn't set out to deceive anybody. I mean, this this was purely a test to see how good this is. So it doesn't catch out people who really know what they're listening for. But for your average person, they can be easily deceived. And this is a big worry. And Which is yes, so crazy can... because you literally can just somebody can start releasing Michael Jackson albums. Making yes, they new, could. It's literally like changed the music industry. Yes, they could. I mean, obviously, the real deal creators would argue that someone can't be them. Only they're as good at being them. And it might look like them. But what it might do is deflate or damage the image, the brand image. It's like a cheap imitation. So what the industry is now looking at doing is perhaps considering putting some kind of digital watermark into this kind of thing. Yes. And this is already doable. And in the same way that as I mentioned, Rick Waitman was able to say that's not Frank Sinatra. There are giveaways and uh, experienced ears and eyes can spot them, but computer programs sure as hell can spot them. And so in the future, what we'll probably see is that people will run these things through an AI detector, because when there was all the furore around chat GPT recently and people were saying, if I get this to do my homework for me, will my teacher spot it? And uh, someone I interviewed put some tracks of chat GPT through a system to look for plagiarism. And it was pretty able, pretty quickly able to spot what the computer had written versus what a human had written. So I think it will be spottable in the future and discernible as computer generated. But at the same time, the milieu we're operating in, you could easily be, albeit in the short term, deceived by this kind of thing. And I feel it's, it's both exciting, but very concerning all at the same time. Definitely. I just am I'm, I'm fascinated at how um, accurate it is. Like you say, it's only a few people that might know that, OK, um, this is not the real Frank Sinatra, as you said. But when I'm wondering when it will get to a point where as much as everybody will have access to use Kanye West's voice or a Donald Trump voice and release a clip and say this is unreleased footage or clip of Donald Trump saying something, at what point then will the technology catch up and be accessible for all of us to detect what's real and what's not, visually and audibly? Mm. Well, I think that at the same in the same way that historically journalism, whether it was on the radio, in a newspaper, in a book, we had an editorial process that would safeguard the public and the consumer against the message. And then the Internet came along and it broke all of this because it was possible for anybody to say anything. And unless you knew what you were looking for and how to interpret things with caution, you could be deceived. But people are catching up. And in the same way that billboards would have pictures of models that have been airbrushed. 
some people said, I feel very deceived because these pictures have been airbrushed and mm. that's not really what that woman looks like. She's much slimmer when the computer takes, you know, a stone off her or something. Yes. Um, we've all got used to the fact that what you see is not necessarily what you get and you, one has to be very cautious. And I think it's an educational thing. And as, as children come through school now, schools are teaching you how to be very careful not to be seduced by misinformation. And that's going to become more important than ever in the future. All right, let's take a quick break and uh, we we will take your calls and WhatsApps when we come back. 702, the naked scientist. Dr. Chris, I just had the most amazing thought. Like while we're all afraid of 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 these um the development of this type of technology, I realized for myself who my voice is my work. I literally could take so many voiceover jobs sounding like a man, sounding like a woman. And just, you know, talking into the microphone the way that I do. But you sort of already can do that because there are voice synthesizers. And many would argue that the the talent is what you say with that voice. It's a bit like Mm. if I had your musical instrument and you're a really talented musician. You have that vocabulary. You have that playing ability. You have that musicality. The instrument is merely the mouthpiece. It's the Mm. channel it flows through. And so for you, your skill is your ability to see a story, make it into a piece of exciting radio and then communicate it. And that's the whole package. And the voice is part of that. It's mm. not the be all and end all. If you if you stripped out all of the back end, the engine room behind it, which is your brain, then it's just a voice. So you'd have to have something good to put through it, if you see what I mean. It's rather like having a speaker system and a really nice set of speakers and no record to play. I think that was explained very, very well. Let's go to the lines as we wrap up with Dr. Chris Smith. John in Olivenote Bosch. Hi, John. Uh, good afternoon, Rehle Bukhile, mm. your listeners and the naked scientist. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I want to know why there is still one-fifth uh, amount of oxygen in the atmosphere when carbon dioxide is increasing and carbon dioxide uses oxygen uh, to, to, to become a, a, a carbon dioxide. That reaction that uh, makes carbon dioxide is a chemical reaction with oxygen but oxygen carbon dioxide is increasing but oxygen is remaining at one-fifth of the atmosphere so i, I think mm. there's something that um baffles me there all right john that's a good question doctor hi john a uh, couple of things to consider here one is that you're right oxygen makes up a fifth of the composition of the atmosphere give or takes about 21 percent the planet is huge relative to us, and the atmosphere is huge. Therefore, the volume of oxygen is huge. And at the moment, the amount of carbon dioxide, while rising and important, even at trace levels, is still very small. So relative to the amount of oxygen, the amount of carbon that we've burned is small. Thank goodness. The other thing to consider is that the atmosphere is a dynamic process. So Oxygen in the atmosphere comes from a couple of places. It comes from green plants on land and it comes from marine plants in the sea. And there's also a contribution from chemical reactions that can sometimes produce oxygen. Carbon dioxide is also being dissolved into the ocean. So plants take it in and return oxygen to the atmosphere. So there are factors that increase oxygen in the atmosphere as well as factors that can reduce carbon dioxide. And over the scale of geological time, this keeps the atmospheric composition in balance. And it's only with our determined efforts over the last couple of hundred years of releasing about a trillion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that we've made the relatively small, thank goodness at the moment, changes that we have. But if we were to carry on, and on the scale of a whole planet in geological time, you would begin to see a change in oxygen levels. And in fact, the high levels of oxygen are a relatively recent thing. Uh, during the first bulk of the planet's existence, there was very little oxygen in the atmosphere because it's so reactive. It was bound up in minerals and rocks. And it was the creation of things that can harness the energy of the sun and release oxygen through the process of photosynthesis. And initially that was primitive bacteria-like species and subsequently green plants and marine plants. That's what subsequently pushed the oxygen levels in the atmosphere up. But it wasn't like that always. Thank you so much for that question coming through from John. That's all we have time for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris Smith. We'll be back together next week.